Good morning, everyone. Um, let's see that I can manage this. When you get a professor, it's not obvious that they can get technology to work. Okay, we missed the title slide. Success, excellent. So I want to talk today about behavioral economics and how to actually set plans for both accumulation of assets and decumulation of assets. And I want to do it for quote unquote humans. And what I mean by that is the average person who is not good with numbers, how many of you know that 10% and 0.1 and one in 10 and 10 in 100 is the same? You're probably saying, why are we even paying this guy to come here and to ask such a dumb question? But you would be surprised how many people do not know that. So people have a hard time with numbers. They have a hard time with money. They have a hard time making all those choices. And I think as a society, whether it is in Latin America, whether it is in the US, we have to create systems that really work for humans, not just for people with PhDs in economics and big Excel spreadsheets. So I'm gonna talk about how to really make an entire system of accumulation and decumulation easy for the UPS driver, for the average person who is trying to create a pension. So there are obviously some challenges, a more experience you know, with the US, uh, but I think a lot of it might apply globally. So in the US, our system is a defined contribution system. You virtually put money in. It's voluntary, unlike Australia. So you don't have to put the money in. You decide how to invest it. And when you get to retirement, you have to figure out how to create a paycheck, how to actually create a lifelong monthly paycheck. So let's look at the labels of some of those plans, and I'm gonna throw some of them, but these are randomly selected, what we call 401k, which is the main system in the US, uh, plans. You notice some of those plans, including probably a company you're familiar with, UPS. Anyone noticing a problem here on this slide? All of those plans are always called savings plans. We never educate people that they're an investment plan as well. We never educate people that it should provide income. We never think of those as a pension at the end of the day. So this is a place you put some money as like savings. And I think it creates a huge problem down the road because people never ever thought of those pots of money as how do I create a pension? What's the purpose of this vehicle? <clears throat> so we're gonna talk both about kind of the accumulation and the decumulation, but I think globally, we're kind of thinking about those defined contribution plans too much as just an accumulation vehicle, and we kind of don't connect the dots to make them into a real retirement uh, plan. Now, obviously, every challenge is an opportunity. So if we can actually find a way to change the system so it's both accumulation and decumulation, so it's not just savings plans, those are retirement plans, <laughs> then there'll be a lot of benefits. The employees would get a lifelong paycheck, peace of mind. Even in the US, a country that is wealthier than a lot of other countries, about 80% of people are terrified they're gonna run out of money in retirement. A lot of employers want to do the right things, and if they actually help employees retire with dignity, that would obviously <coughs> check the box on that mission. And if you think about the financial services industry, in the US at least, a lot of money goes out of the system as people retire. More than half, more than half of the assets in 401k plans in the US have already left the system 
to go outside. So think about the economics of plan providers. When we create a mentality of savings, people retire, they take the money out. I can literally tell you about a UPS driver. He didn't have a lot. He cashed out his savings plan. He didn't think about it as a retirement plan. He went and bought a Cadillac. And he bought a second Cadillac all at once. So there's a big challenge with the way we actually frame those plans to the end users. So I want to talk about some solutions, and I want to leave you today with at least three behavioral ingredients that I think could really help, both on the accumulation and the decumulation. So inertia, or the status quo, is incredibly powerful. How many of you have something you need to do, something on your to-do list that you just didn't get around to doing? Anyone? Right? It's so easy to do it tomorrow, but if you look at your smartphones, tomorrow doesn't exist in the calendar. There's only Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's not a day of the week. Um, so if we make things easy, then we're actually going to solve the number one behavioral challenge, which is inertia. And in a perfect world, it would virtually be an autopilot. Okay? <laughs> we would just do it for them. Now, we're not going to force them to do anything. They can always change their mind and opt out. So this is probably um, the, the piece of work that I've done that received the most um, coverage, which is to help people save. And I've done this with Richard Taylor at the University of Chicago. And the idea was to automate everything. We're going to automatically enroll people to save because in the U.S. it's not mandatory. We get easily 90% of people to save that way. And we're going to automatically escalate their savings. And that's a program that we designed, which we called Save More Tomorrow. And the idea was we actually worked with a blue-collar manufacturing uh, company. The employees didn't make much money. They were struggling to pay the bills. That was back in '98. And we asked them, do you want to save more? Because if they don't, who am I to tell them that it's better to save instead of buying ice cream to the kids today? But virtually everyone told us they want to save. They just don't know how. They can't even pay the rent. They can't actually put food on the table at the end of the month. So we came with the idea of what if you save more in the future? And everyone liked that because it's like our exercise plan, right? We're now on the beach at the resort, all you can eat actually, and we're gonna eat too much. But when we get back home, whether it's Chile, Brazil, wherever it is, we're gonna actually exercise and we're gonna eat healthy and we're gonna do all the right things. So self-control is a huge problem Today, it doesn't really exist tomorrow. So we virtually told people save more in the future. But we had two problems. First of all, when? So what we did, we made them save more every time they got a pay raise. Why? We didn't want them to feel the loss, the reduction in their paychecks. So we said, you never have to cut your paycheck. Only when your paycheck goes up, you're going to save more. And the last thing is, it's never going to happen. It's going to be like our diet plan, like our exercise plan. We're going to just defer it. So we put it on an autopilot. If someone told us, I want to save more, we said, okay, we're just going to make it happen. Every time before an increase kicked in, we virtually told everyone, it's about to happen. If you don't like it, if you change your mind, this is how you opt out. What you see on the screen is actually the saving rates 
of people who didn't want guidance, advice, who were not offered this program. There was another group, most of the employees, 80%, actually 90%, who wanted help. So an advisor talked to them and said, you have to save a lot more. And they almost threw at him eggs. They were like, we can't do it. 80% of the employees, they wanted to chat, they wanted help, they couldn't save more today. We told them, why don't you save more tomorrow? And we're going to see those saving rates. So you could see in the blue bars, those who actually didn't chat with the advisor were saving 6% and nothing changes over time. Those who actually wanted help and 80% of them said they would love to save more tomorrow, they were saving the least. They were struggling. They were saving about 3.5%. And every year we increased it by 3% when they got their pay raise. Very quickly, they quadrupled their saving rates. They were saving almost 14%. That's a financial makeover, a game change for them. Fast forward, there's about 25 million people on this kind of program in the US, but we could do a lot better, a lot better with technology, with data, with personalization. At least in the US, the retirement industry is very old fashioned when it comes to data, technology, innovation. We're not doing what Google does. We're nowhere close to what Amazon and Netflix do. But we could do better. So think about it. We're telling everyone with kind of automatic increases, everything auto, we're telling everyone, why don't you save more next year and more and more? But what if they're late paying their credit card debt? What if they're already paying 24% on their credit card debt? Should we actually make them save more or first pay, pay their debt? There is always the risk that if we make them save even more, they're just going to pile more credit card debt at a very high rate. So we thought about it and kind of I came with this idea that let's look at the debt levels and see if people have expensive debt or maybe no debt. And now you're going to say, how can you do that? So in the US, we have credit bureaus. You could just connect, get the data. It's very easy, actually. Mm -hmm. So you could literally, for everyone in your AFP, for everyone in whatever system, retirement system you have, if you, in the US, you could literally take um, get credit reports on everyone. And you could now start thinking how it would affect your recommendation. The other thing, in the US, matching employee contributions is voluntary. Some employers, like the University of Southern California, would have a very generous match. Two dollars for every dollar you put in. Others would have none. So we kind of thought about this two by two metric. Are there big incentives to save, like two for one match? And are there big disincentives to save, like I can barely pay my expensive credit card debt? And if we think about that, and we got the data, it shouldn't be that difficult to create a personalized version of save more tomorrow. If there's no match and I have no debt, maybe I'm slightly struggling to pay the bills, but I'm doing okay, I'm not piling debt, maybe I'll just save more tomorrow when I get a pay raise. But what if I actually have a very generous match, so I got the incentives to save, and on the flip side, I got very expensive debt. So I need to balance the two. And maybe I'll still save more tomorrow. 
But here's the interesting thing. If I don't have that, and the match is very generous, why wait? Why save more tomorrow? Save more today and tomorrow. And probably the most interesting box is, what if there's no match? And I got piles of debt. I would argue save less today and more tomorrow. And then with machine learning, we can actually start fine-tuning the, the formulas at an individual level. How many of you exercise? Excellent. How many of you do push-ups? Excellent. How many of you can do more than 10? How many of you can do more than 50? How many of you can do more than 100 in one go? Huge variability, right? Huge variability. So if you think about training and a trainer, I would argue that the trainer should be like a financial planner. The trainer looks at you and he says, oh, you could do 10 push-ups? Maybe today we'll go for 12. He's not going to say, let's go for 100. But if you're one of those people that raise their hands very quickly, I can easily do 50, the trainer shouldn't tell you to do 12. He should tell you to do maybe 52, maybe 55. So we have to actually start thinking, and the trainer has those intuitions. He kind of sees how you breathe. He kind of, next session, you tell him, oh, you know, my neck hurts. Yeah, okay, it was too much. He can fine-tune it. And his goal is to push you as much as he can, but not too much. With machine learning and the data, we could get the feedback, and we could start learning how far we could push savings without accidentally piling up debt. So that's where I think we need to start taking, in a sense, our interventions and combine data, personalization. And of course, in each country it would be different because maybe you have debt, maybe you don't have debt, maybe you have the ability, like the US, to get the data easily, maybe not. But we shouldn't give up on personalizing with what, whichever data we have. Okay. So make it easy, the autopilot, the auto everything, works incredibly well to accumulate assets. And in a lot of countries, we're still realistically in the business of accumulating assets. But sooner or later, most countries will get to the point of decumulation. In countries with aging population, like the US, <laughs> are already there. And can we actually create a version of the auto everything for decumulation? And I would argue that it's very tricky. And intuitively, think about the UPS drivers. UPS hires tens of thousands of drivers every year. They're generally young, healthy, make the same amount of money, roughly, if we put them all in the same solution, save 6% today, 8 next year, and so on, the one shoe fits all is not far away from a reasonable solution. Fast forward decumulation, a lot of differences across people. Some have families, some are divorced, some are in great health, some are in poor health and so on. On the slide, you would see just one little individual difference in retirement, uh, mental health. So when we're young, almost nobody has dementia. If you hit the late 80s, 90s, almost one third of people have cognitive impairment. One third have full-blown dementia and one-third are still sharp. And no matter which aspect of individual differences you look, there are huge differences. And putting everyone in the same solution would not make sense. 
ideas that are floating around in the US to automatically place everyone in annuities without the ability to opt out doesn't make any sense whatsoever. You cannot put a woman in her 60s who, God forbid, has advanced breast cancer into a lifelong annuity because she'll never collect anything from it. So individual differences are critical. Okay. So the autopilot has challenges. We can't fully automate necessarily the decumulation. But that doesn't mean we can't actually make it easy. So we could actually make guesses with data. We could make guesses what people like you would like and create smart defaults as a starting point. This is how you should approach creating a retirement income plan. But then it's critical that we make it easy to change it. That it's really easy for people to personalize the solution to their needs. <clears throat> and <clears throat> in the US it's, it's a big problem. I'm imagining in a lot of countries we have to also make sure that it's not all digital. I know that it's so nice to kind of use the scale of the digital world. In the US, it's very common for a large retirement provider not to have email addresses, not to have cell phone numbers for about half of their book of business. So whatever solution we have has to also fit paper until we get more digital engagement from people. And there is data that people who are not as digitally savvy are getting worse and worse deals on credit cards, on mortgages, in the entire financial system. Okay, so that's what actually one solution, one that I've built with my team, but you know, I don't want to focus on what specifically we do. I want to focus on the behavioral principles that guided our, our thinking. So this is literally, literally a report we could send to people, whether it's email or whether it's paper. It's someone who is reaching retirement, <clears throat> but not now. Sorry for looking with my back to you, but my vision is not as good to see it on the other screen. But you would see that this Linda, the school teacher, who is 52, she's seeing what her paychecks would be when she retires in 2037. Because we've guessed that if she's given the right information, she would most likely retire at 67. Now, we could be wrong. So we have to make it really easy to change. But we also tell her what she'll get from Social Security. And she can know in plain English what to expect. And while, you know, this might look simplistic to a financial planner, there's a lot you could put behind the scenes, guessing what's her health situation and much more actually. But this is all in plain English in today's dollars. Side note, people are really bad understanding inflation. I believe any number presented to individuals, especially with long-term decisions, should be inflation adjusted already. And what we do here, we virtually use smart defaults to guess what people like you would do if they were informed. So we're not looking at everyone else and saying that's what you should do because a lot of people make bad financial decisions and we don't want a herd mentality of following the same mistake. So when we do this, we actually look at people who were given the information, who understood the issues, what did they choose? Are you like one of them? This is most likely what you would choose. Um, 
we'll skip some screens. Next thing, we told Linda she should retire, we think she would retire in 15 years. She might say, I actually don't need much. I can actually live on a lot less, I have a lot of hobbies. And you guys don't know, but everyone in my family die young. I want to retire sooner. Or she might say, I actually want to leave a lot more money to my kids. I guess you probably didn't know that. We need to adjust the plan. Whatever the thing is, we have to make it easy for people to personalize and to make trade-offs. As a general rule, people hate trade-offs. We want to retire early. We want a big paycheck. We want all our money back from Social Security because it's ours. We don't want any risk. It should last forever. We want to travel, and we don't want to give up on Christmas gifts. We want everything. People hate trade-offs. So we need to make it easy for people to make informed trade-offs. So what you see on the screen is actually when to claim Social Security benefits. In the U.S., it's a choice. You could get a smaller paycheck now or a bigger paycheck later. It's a very complicated decision because if you're in good health, you should wait because you're going to get a much bigger paycheck and you're still going to live to enjoy it. If you're in poor health, take the smaller paycheck now because you might never get to get the bigger paycheck. So we plug in all this stuff and in plain English, tell Linda, if you retire at that age and collect Social Security at that age, here's your paycheck. Make the choices that fit you, all in plain English. She knows nothing about inflation and the money illusion. It's all adjusted for inflation. She doesn't have to think about it. And so on. Just make it easy for people. <clears throat> um, further personalizing it. I can tell you in the U.S., there's not a single, I repeat it, not a single retirement plan provider who would tell Linda, if you want to leave $50,000 to your kids in today's dollars, and you don't want to leave it today, because you might need the money, but this is your goal. Given longevity risk, given market risk, given inflation, in order to leave 50000 down the road, you need to reduce your paycheck by $97 every month. Not a single place to find it. Zero. Yet, this is one of the most important things for people. And I would bet you that even now we have a diverse set of countries. Anyone is familiar with a provider in your domestic market where someone can go and say, not even say it, where they're given choices that are personalized and told, if you want to leave 50,000, your check should be so much smaller. Now, not if you want to leave it now. That's easy. You just put the money aside. If you want it to be in the future. Anyone is familiar with that being available? This is the most important thing for some people. Their kids, their family, their charity, we're not providing it. We're not making it easy for people to make informed trade-off. Bitcoin was very exciting a few months ago. Not anymore. Um, but people always want a dream. That's why they buy lotteries. If you look at the bottom... 20% of the distribution of income in the U.S., people who don't make a lot, they put more money into lottery tickets than into savings for their future. They want a dream. And that desire to get some upside, to have some hope, is very powerful. 
and it's causing you know people to put it all in Bitcoin and those kind of things. We feel that it's very important that decumulation discussions will be positive. I've seen a calculator, online calculator, saying, um, when would you die? This is not a great starting point to engage people. So we've actually found out that there are scenarios where the economy markets do well enough that you could have a bonus check and it would not increase the likelihood of running out of money. So, I was set for the wrong time, typical of me. Um, so, imagine that not only you get your monthly paycheck, there might be an extra modest paycheck at the end of the year. And you could track it through the year, because depending on how the economy is doing and markets, we can actually start predicting what it would do. And the goal is, no matter which system you do, the goal is to give people some hope. I mean, in too many places, retirement is framed as a bad thing, as death, as pessimistic. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to tell you what happens when we bring these kind of solutions to people quickly. So we worked with a financial advisor who helps 401k plans. And we took it to 10 employers in the U.S. All 10 signed up. I've never seen something like this. If you're actually trying to sell products, not the process, not guidance, not solutions, products. If you were to go to employers in the U.S. and you said, Here's the best, the greatest annuity ever invented. You wouldn't get one out of ten to actually implement it. We found out that everyone nowadays wants guidance. And it's a side point, but I think clearly in the U.S., but I think also in other countries, in the U.S., there's zero money to be made on record-keeping, there's money to be made on asset management, but it's been going down, and it's going to keep going down. There's a ton of money to be made on advice and guidance. The market is just begging for it. And players like Vanguard are going there. We can offer an index fund, institutionally priced at three basis points, or we could get 15 basis points to guide people. Which one do you take, right? Um, a slide on social security. I might skip it in the interest of time, but people seem to be making smarter decisions. Many more are willing to delay claiming. Be patient when you actually make it easy to make trade-offs. Maybe I broke the... No, I didn't break it. Uh, well, I have three minutes to accidentally break the... Control. I have a history doing that. Um, so I want to leave you here with a couple of important notes about personalization. So one thing we did, we took the entire population of people and we started to look at if we had one shoe, how many people would it fit? If kind of we have the same solution for everyone in decumulation. So, the first thing that we actually ask is that they'll have the moderate risk portfolio. So, it's, I'm sorry, it's not actually a portfolio. When we talk about risk, we think about the likelihood of running out of money, which would include both investment risk and longevity risk. People often think of risk as just investing. So, when we actually looked at how many wanted kind of the moderate risk solution, we lost some people. But then we said, no bequest. Because if you're going to automate it, if you're going to have one shoe, you can't set the bequest because you don't know. Some don't have kids. Some don't want to leave anything behind. Then, of course, we said that they would 
spend the same every month. You lose more people because we find some people, especially after the pandemic, prefer to spend more today. They want to take the kids on a holiday to Punta Cana while they're young and healthy, while they can still do it. And then when you <clears throat> think about social security claiming, which might be a unique thing for the U.S., but kind of optimizing that, personalizing it, we lose more people. And at the end, if we kind of assume average health, because if you have one shoe fits all, you have to assume kind of averages, we're left with 4% of the people. We have to personalize the accumulation. This is a Wall Street Journal um, article I wrote a couple of weeks ago, actually when the queen died. They were generous enough and probably smart enough to put it on the cover page. So the cover page had the queen died. Next to it, there was Ukraine gaining land from Russia. And on the other side, there was how to create a retirement paycheck. The number one most read piece for the next three days was how to create a retirement paycheck. Number two was Ukraine, and the queen was down the list. Now, there's a message here. People are really desperate for solutions if it really grabs their attention so much. But you would see here, the article talked about uh, Linda and uh, David. They have the same amount of money, the same age, the same health, slightly different preferences. And we calculated what's a sustainable paycheck. Obviously slightly bigger for David because men uh, don't live as long. So Linda would have to have a bit less. But then when we added individual differences like when they want to retire, whether they're willing to accept bigger or smaller risk of running out of money, whether they want to leave a modest bequest or not, whether they want to spend more early or later in retirement, the paychecks are six to seven times different. So we got to personalize the accumulation. Just to summarize before I run out of money, out of time, uh, but I guess that Freudian thing is actually related because people are really terrified of running out of money. Um, auto everything is a great first step to help with the accumulation, but <coughs> it doesn't work for decumulation. We need to personalize. And we need to create, in a sense, pension plans that fit the 21st century. And when I talk about pensions, I don't mean defined benefit pensions and kind of going backward where the employer has to assume a lot of risk. I just mean kind of figuratively creating a lifelong paycheck that people can count on. So I ran out of uh, time, luckily not out of money. Um, thank you so much.